Hi everyone, welcome back. So in our last video, we defined that the gra uh, what a gravitational field force field strength is. It's basically the strength, and I'm going to write this in a, in a in in text rather than as an equation. It's basically the force uh, force per unit mass at that point. And this is the important thing to point out. What do I mean by that? At that point. So think of it this way: if you have uh, if you have any object, right? The gravitational force, and let's look at the let's look at a planet, right? So assume that this is some kind of a planet. Um, you have, and I'm I'm I'm, um, I'm modeling it as a point mass. So you have on the surface of the Earth, let's say, you know, in the northern hemisphere, the gravitational force is going to be acting in this direction, right? In the southern hemisphere, in this direction. In the um, somewhere near the equator, perhaps, right? It's going to be acting like this and on the other side of the Earth as well. So if we kind of look somewhere in the mid latitudes, like that, like that, and like that, right? So what I want you to just notice is the lines that I have drawn, these arrows that I've drawn, we call them lines of force. So these lines of force are getting further apart, right? So they're getting further apart as you are, um, as uh, you go farther away from uh, the center of mass. Hopefully that makes sense um, from center of mass because, you know, this field is radial, right? So any, you know, these lines of force are quite close together at this point, but they're much farther apart at this point. So this is what we mean by uh, the gravitational uh, s strength of a field being different at different points, depending on how far away you are from the source of the gravitational field. Um, so what I want you to understand also is that on the surface uh, of the Earth, right, the Earth is huge. You know, like, I mean, um, if we if we look at the, the radius of the Earth, we're talking about, you know, something on the order of 6,400 kilometers. Is it really going to matter if you are, you know, on the surface of the earth or if you're on the like you know 10 kilometers up in the air right if you're that far away is it really going to matter to the force of gravity you know so like uh, if you want to call this position a and you want to call this position b you can easily say you know that g uh, the force of uh, uh, gravity at point a is approximately equal to the force of gravity at point b you wouldn't be wrong uh, to say that um, so what you can say is under these kind of circumstances, right? If you are, if you're talking about large object, for large objects, uh, the word you want to use is uh, uniform, and you have a uniform gravitational uh, field exists. What else could we uh, try and uh, learn about uh, gravitational uh, field strength? Let's take a look at our Newton's law of gravitation once again. So here I've written out uh, the Newton's law of gravitation. But hang on a second. Isn't uh, uh, we just kind of derived that uh, G, the acceleration due to gravity, is F divided by M, force per unit mass. The strength of the gravitational force is force that's experienced per unit mass. So if, if that's the case, then hmm. Why don't we uh, simplify this a little bit and uh, call this M and use a capital M here to denote the other mass, right? So if we write it like this, what is F divided by M? Well, that's simply going to be G. Sorry, let me write it like this. F divided by M, which is equal to G, is equal to whatever is left on the other side of the equation, which is GM divided by R squared. So let us say for the sake of example, that on the planet Mars, right, um, the, the radius of the planet is 3.4 times 10 to the 3 kilometers. And uh, its mass, and this is going to be a big M here, is um, 6.4 times 10 to the 23 kilometers. 
uh, I beg your pardon, kilograms. So in this kind of situation, what is the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of Mars? What is the R, what is the gravitational field strength on the surface of Mars? So it's basically given by the equation we have just derived, which is if we plug in the numbers times the mass of Mars, which is 6.4 times 10 to the 23 kilograms, divided by uh, 3.4 times 10 to the 6 meters squared. And if you work through all of that, you're going to find that it's 3.7 newtons per kilogram. So the, surf, uh, the the force of gravity on the surface of Mars, the gravitational field strength of the surface of Mars, is, uh, is going to be about a third of what uh, we experience on uh, the Earth. Um, so that brings us to the uh, end of this uh, particular point of discussion. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about gravitational force between point masses such that, uh, like, can we talk about it, uh, uh, can we use it to talk about circular orbits, uh, including geostationary orbits uh, of uh, satellites. So let's look at that for a second. Just recall now, if you haven't seen the video on centripetal force, I would recommend you go have a look at that right now, which is chapter seven. Um, so what is centripetal force? Let's take a look at that, for, uh, just remind ourselves. So centripetal force, we remember the equation for that is F times the mass of this certain object times the linear velocity it's moving at squared divided by, uh, divided by the radius uh, of uh, the, the circle that it's mo moving in. That is your centripetal force. Now take the case of, uh, let's say this is the planet Earth, right? And around the planet Earth somewhere, you have um, you have a satellite. I'm going to put it as a box because I can't draw very well. So it's a satellite that's moving uh, around the surface of the Earth. So what are the forces that are acting on this satellite? I'm going to use a different color to denote this. Um, so there's going to be the weight of the satellite, right? Which is derived, which is providing the um, centripetal force. The gravitational pull of the satellite on the satellite provides the centripetal force to keep the satellite moving at a linear velocity v, so constant acceleration motion, as we talked about in chapter seven. The way you should think about it is the force of gravity is giving the centripetal force, and it is causing this body to fall out of its straight line path. It should be moving in a straight line path, but because there is a gravitational pull of this of the Earth it is constantly falling out of its expected straight line path. And people and objects inside the satellite are therefore experiencing a free fall situation and are therefore experiencing apparent weightlessness. I wanna say that one more time. You are falling. You are in a free fall because of the, the, uh, the, um, the gravitational pull of the Earth. Uh, and as a result of that, the people and objects inside the satellite are experiencing weightlessness. So let's get back to the discussion that we're trying to have here. Um, so the centripetal force is the same, is providing the, the, the um, I beg your pardon, it's the other way around. The, gravi the gravitational force is providing the centripetal uh, force. And as a result of that, it is completely accurate for you to write the centripetal force as being equal to the, uh, the gravitational force. Uh, force. And uh, as a result of that, one moment please, uh, so we get v squared is equal to g m divided by r. And for simplicity, you know, we write it as that because masses will cancel each other out. G and R will remain, and this R is gonna go up to the top here. What about the angular velocity? We know how this goes, right? The angular velocity is going to be V divided by R. So as a result of that, um, if we, if we um, work this out, it's going to be G M upon R cubed square root of that. 
So you can see that the angular velocity and hence the frequency and the period for one orbit are dependent on the radius of this object. And the uh, relationship for uh, the uh, period of one orbit, period is given by the, uh, by the capital T, uh, is going to be 2 pi upon omega. Why 2 pi? Because the circle is 2 pi radians and omega is going to be in radians per unit time. And what is the frequency uh, going to be? Frequency is going to be the reciprocal, omega upon 2 pi. So let's see if we can uh, wor uh, work this out through an example. So let us say you have a satellite that's orbiting at 100 kilometers. What is the period? What is the period of this uh, satellite? And what is the velocity of this satellite? So what we have given to us is that the mass of the Earth is going to be uh, 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. And the uh, radius of uh, the Earth is going to be 6.4 times 10 to the 3 kilometers. So, first of all, I want to make sure you understand this. This is the radius of the Earth. So the radius of the orbit is going to be the 6,400 kilometers plus the 100 kilometers that it's all orbiting the Earth at, right? So orbiting at a altitude of 100 kilometers right here. Um, so this is going to be 6,500 kilometers or 6.5 times 10 to the 6 meters. So what is the angular velocity? We know the formula. We have that available to us. That's omega is equal to g times m divided by r cubed. And if you plug in, you know what g is, you know uh, what m is, you know what the r is. So if you plug that in, you will get 1.2 times 10 to the negative 3 radians per second. So as a result of that, we can now find out what is the time period that it takes for the satellite to orbit the Earth. And that is 2 pi divided by 1.2 times 10 to the negative 3, which works out to be about 1.4 hours. You'll get the answer in seconds, and I just skipped that step, uh, the converting the seconds to the hours. Um, and how do you calculate the uh, the linear velocity? It's V is R times omega. Um, and we know what the orbital radius is. Remember, it is the radius of the orbit, not the radius of the Earth. So it's going to be 6.5 times 10 to the um, uh, 6 meters. Um, and if you multiply that by the angular velocity omega, you're going to get about 7,800 meters per second or 7.8 kilometers per second. Both of those are correct. That's moving at quite a speed, isn't it? 7.8 kilometers uh, per second. Um, I want to talk to you also about geostationary uh, orbits. Imagine that there's a satellite orbiting the Earth and its orbital path is directly above uh, the equator. And if the satellite spins in the same direction as the Earth spins, and it has an orbital period of 24 hours, it will remain over the same point above the Earth's surface. This is a type of orbit that's used for communication satellites. So based on this kind of, this kind of an example, you're gonna see that there's only one orbit. There's only one orbital radius that will work for this satellite. And this is the beauty part of science. You're going to need to do have a lot of international cooperation because countries, every country has some kind of a communication uh, satellite or is piggybacking on other countries' communication satellites. So there's only one radius that you can have if you want to maintain communications 24-7. So what would that radius be? Let's quickly work that out. So just jot it down for you what the mass of the Earth is and what the radius uh, of uh, the Earth is. So... If you want to have a geostationary orbit, so you're orbiting the Earth at 24 uh, at um, um, 24 hours essentially, right? Like your orbital period of time is 24 hours, which is equal to uh, 86,400 seconds. So we can plug this 
into our equation to find out what the angular velocity would be in a situation like this, right? And we know that this is equal to g times m divided by r cubed, and we take the square root of all that. So we know this already, right? So as a result of that, you can work out, just if you use simple arithmetic, you can work out what, um, uh, what the um, what the angular uh, velocity, excuse me, uh, what, what the orbital radius is going uh, to be. So if we expand this equation, we're going to get something that looks like this. And if you work out this equation, you're going to get this as, uh, as the... Um, value of r cubed. So if you take the cube root of r, you're going to come up with 4.2 times 10 to the 7 meters, which means that you have to subtract from this the radius of the earth, right? So the height above the earth, let's put it that way, uh, above earth that this satellite needs to orbit at is going to be 4.2 times 10 to the 7 minus 6.4 times 10 to the 6, and that works out to be 3.6 times 10 to the 7 meters. So that is the orbital height required to maintain a sta geostationary orbit. So let's uh, take a break here and com come back into our last video for this chapter, which is going to be on gravitational potential. So I'll see you in the next video.